firstly, John, start off, I mean, congratulations on, on the book. Um, I, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, obviously, the book's not out till the 28th of May. Um, so uh, I don't know if you've got a copy. I, the, the publisher sent me a PDF. So thank you, John. That's the copy of the book. And I, I, uh, your, your, yours, yours went in the post from the distributor yesterday. Oh, lovely. OK, great. So uh, look forward to receiving that. But obviously they sent me the PDF, so I had an opportunity yeah. to look at that. But I thoroughly enjoyed it. it, it it's full of um, a very poignant moments um, all, all the way through uh, a particularly poignant. Just for the people who don't know you, just a very, very brief um, introduction that John uh, served with the RAF uh, 15 years, yeah. I believe, was, was the case. That's right, yeah. um, had the misfortune, which is an understatement, of being shot down <laughs> in, in the Gulf War, and he told his story of being a prisoner of war in, in Tornado Down. Written numerous uh, best-selling books covering the stories of, of the Second World War. Many of them have been bestsellers, and I, I, I have no doubt that um, Lancaster will become uh, a bestseller as well. So, so John, why, why do Lancaster? Why write this book? Um, well, first of all, Steve, I want to obviously thank you because of, you know you've always helped me with sourcing accounts, with um, with finding people's photographs, and allowing me kind of access to your fantastic archive. So thank you. Okay. And then, you know, kind of a more general point, you know, historians, authors, writers, you know, kind of most of the time really do help each other out. Yeah. Uh, and it's, so it's you know I really appreciate it. And when you see when your book arrives in the post either today or tomorrow, I hope, okay. <laughs> depending on what the mail is like in the middle of this COVID thing, yeah. you'll see that your name appears in the, uh, in the acknowledgements with many other writers. Because writing a book's quite a tricky process, trying to find all of the people and all of the different stories. But why Lancaster? Well, um, as you know, I wrote a book about the Spitfire two years ago, which did incredibly well. And I'm not a, a nuts and rivets man. I'm a, a people man. Uh, I write about the stories of the people involved. So Lancaster <clears throat> isn't a story about uh, how many nuts were there, how many rivets, how the wings were attached. It's the story of the people. And that's what attracted me to the book. Um, it has the stories of humanity, whether that's the, <clears throat> the ladies in the factory that were, you know, spot riveting the the skin to the uh, to the frame or whether that's the the wafts on the ground who are driving the air crews out to their aircraft to go on missions over uh, ops over berlin or whatever i've always been interested in the personal stories and lancaster has um afforded me the wonderful opportunity to speak to some of the living veterans and tell their stories and that's what i think brings history to life and i, I you established that right from the word go um with the book terrifically and it top and tails the book very well as as well exactly that that's the the poignant moment and as you say it's not just about the nuts and bolts and it's not necessarily just about the operations as well i love the way you go into family relationships romantic relationships um and you touch on on lack of moral moral fiber now i mean um lack of moral fiber is it something they were right to have at that time was it did they overdo it um obviously i'm sure they wouldn't be doing it now that's for sure well i mean interestingly i've just been writing a bit about you know the next book is about the tornado <clears throat> and there were a couple of instances where people in the first gulf war flying tornadoes uh found it quite difficult to go on in the face of incredible adversity and death we would never use the term lack of moral fiber now <clears throat> and i mean just for people who don't know the term a quick explanation if you go back to the first world war um if you had let's just call it a, a mental or a physical breakdown <clears throat> an inability to go on if you said i've had too much <clears throat> and either you said out loud i can't do this anymore i've seen too much death i've seen too much suffering or you had a, a, a quite literal mental breakdown uh, and, and couldn't do anything um, you were mostly labelled a coward, and we put people against a, a wooden post and shot them for that. Um, what we would now refer to as post-traumatic stress disorder, something that still affects, <clears throat> you know, members of the military, members of the ambulance service, members of the uh, police service, and anybody who's come into contact or been involved in a, a, a traumatic incident. And in the Second World War, we didn't 
shoot people. We didn't kill them. We didn't execute them if they said they couldn't go on. But in some cases, we branded them <coughs> in a metaphorical sense. I've got a couple of, <coughs> excuse me, I've got a couple of logbooks of very brave aircrew, and there's a big LMF stamped in red across the last page of their flying logbook. Lack of moral fibre. Mm. And what it meant was you were you couldn't go on. You'd had enough. You could you'd seen too much death. You'd seen too much destruction. Some of them were reasonably well treated. Some of them, and there are just a few instances of this. Um, uh, and again, there's a couple of these accounts where they were paraded in front of the station. Uh, they had their badges of rank torn off them. They had any medals torn off them. Uh, and they were, they were sent away in disgrace. Poor encourage les autres to encourage the others <clears throat> not to do that. And for the most part, most of the men said it was a disgrace. That, that happened to some people if they yes. simply couldn't go on. There was a couple, interestingly, that I spoke to. <clears throat> One of them, a, a flight commander on 617 Squadron after the dams raid. Uh, and he said, he said, whilst he understood that it could be difficult, he said, all of us at some point at two o'clock on a freezing cold morning heading into the heart of the flat, whether it be in Berlin or Munich or wherever it was, all of us would have said we'd rather not be here. But you couldn't say that. You couldn't have people. At what point would you say, well, you can opt out? And so I think that they got it wrong with the way that they uh, labelled people LMF, the way people were treated. But in the context of the time, and this comes in many of our discussions about World War II, whether that's the bombing campaign or whether that's the storming of the D-Day beaches, the context of the time meant it's all they understood and it's all they could do. Yeah. And then in speaking to veterans who had it, that experience, that happening to someone on their squadron, uh, I've never come across anything but compassion to what yeah. happened uh, to their colleagues. And they had a, 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 a they understood what, why it happened. Um, you touch on, on lots of different motivations why uh, air crew signed up uh, to, to fly with, with Bomber Command. I just wondered if you could touch on, on a few of those that you came across. Yeah, I mean, I think first of all, um, when you, were sign when you were signing up as a young man, it w let's go kind of, you know, after the war started, so we have a little bit more understanding, but it's not people who are already in the Air Force. But first of all, you didn't really sign up for Bomber Command, you signed up to be air crew. So whether that was as a pilot, you would be selected, you know, some might go to fighters, some might go to transport aircraft, some might go to bombers, some might go to coastal command, things like that. And it was the same for all of the other uh, trades. So whether you were a navigator, a wireless operator, a bomb aimer, a gunner, uh, or any of those different aviation trades, that's what you kind of signed up for in a selection process, not dissimilar, to ones that we have now, although clearly we don't have many trades anymore. Um, and for the vast majority of the young men I spoke to, and in the book, what I do is I track some of them from the first days of the war. I track some of them from the First World War when they were baby, when they were three and four years old and they saw the first Zeppelin raids. But I track them from almost listening to the, the declaration of war. Some of them were 13, 14 years old then. And then when two or three years later they volunteered to join up, Almost every single one of them who joined, who tried to join up, almost immediately, as soon as they were 17, every single one said, we wanted to be part of it. We wanted to do our duty. We didn't want to be the people sitting at home. We, we wanted to be there. We felt as though we owed it to our nation. And that's kind of quite a, quite a poignant thought for a, a 17, 18, 19 year old boy. Mm -hmm. Many of them were. They were more or less children. They'd led by what our standards, sheltered lives. They'd not had girlfriends. Very few of them had left the family home very far. And here they were, you know, kind of sometimes only a year later, depending on the trade, if you're a, a gunner, you could be on active service not many months after joining. Mm. Uh, and they'd gone from being children to being tail-end gunners on a Lancaster or mid-upper gunners or whatever it was. Uh, and they were still kids. They were kids. Uh, and their motivation was always the same. I wanted to do it as duty, but once they got onto the front line, once they were with their crew of seven on a Lancaster, it was about not letting their side down, not letting their squadron down, most importantly, not letting their crew down. Now, every single one of them I spoke to said, you know, sometimes I was scared. Sometimes I did feel fear. Sometimes I did want to kind of bury my head and wish it would all go away, but I couldn't let my mates down. And that 
notion of duty, military service, and love of your crew, love of your mates, your brothers in arms or sisters in arms, that carries through to the military today. Yeah. And, and Bomber Command was very much a multinational force, and you got people coming from all over the Commonwealth. And on my experience is that they, people, uh, Australia, Canada, they, they're quite happy to come across and do their duty um, for, for the Brit, uh, British nation. But that crew bond is, is phenomenal. And I'm sure you see it when veterans get together now, if they, they meet their colleagues again, the, the same old jokes and the same flirting with the ladies. It all kicks off uh, straight away. I'm, I'm privileged, as you are, to, to meet the vets, you know, sadly, I mean, they are clearly, they are very old people now. You know, when I first started kind of meeting them post Gulf War 30 years ago, but they were still young men in their 60s, 70s. Still now, obviously, if you think about it, uh, if you served at the end of the war and you were 20, you're going to be 90 foot, 95 now. Mm, and so the youngest veterans I've come across, across are 94, 95. Most of them are late 90s. Uh, and they still, you know, when I get to see them either, kind of, you know, I'll bump into some of them in the RAF club in London when it's open post COVID crisis, uh, or, you know, at the Battle of Britain Memorial flight end of season dinner, there'll be kind of a dozen of them there. And their camaraderie is astonishing. And I posted a picture in the run up to D Day, uh, sorry, in the, the run up to the anniversary of D Day. Uh, of uh, the last Battle of Britain Memorial Flight Dinner in the bar at 2 a.m. with, uh, I think, Johnny Johnson, the Dan Busters there, George Dunn, who got a yeah. DFC on Halifax's, I think, and uh, Mosquitoes, yes. yes. John Bell, uh, who was on 617 Squadron with DFC as well. And they're still in the bar. They're yes. still in the bar. They're, what are they? 96, 97, 98, I think, something like that. And they are still in the bar at 2 a.m. And they, first of all, they're sometimes quite reluctant to tell their own stories, but they want to hear the stories of the young guys mm. flying the Spitfires, flying the Lancasters, yeah. flying the Typhoons, uh, flying the E3 sentries uh, and the Hercule, the, the, uh, all the transport aircraft. And so it's fun. Their, their, their sense of belonging is amazing. And what always stri uh, strikes me, Steve, is that the machinery that we flew is 70, 80, 90 years separated. You know, those early days of the war, the, the Hamdens, the, the Whitleys, the first Spitfires. Uh, and then if you then look now at what the, 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 the young men and women are flying now, the machinery is separated. But mm. the bond mm. between the men and the women now and the old men who flew in the war is incredible because they're the same kind of people. And um, I, I haven't experienced that first hand but it's a privilege to see it and, and as you say to, to spend spend time with the guys when they're they're relating yep. their stories and the years are dropping away and all, all that's happening yeah. uh, another particularly poignant part i found in the book was you go on to cover some last letters that were that were written about about air crew um personal question here did you write a last letter uh, i did yeah very good question i've been looking at this in actual fact um so the last letters written during the Second World War were, you know, there, there was basically to be delivered if I don't come home type thing. Mm. And I, uh, I wrote one in the, the, for the Gulf, um, was that 29 years ago? I don't remember anything about that at all, but I do remember the one that I wrote when I went out to Bosnia in 1993 on the, uh, the, the operations over uh, the former Yugoslavia, as it was then. Uh, and I remember that, although to my eternal regret, when I came home, I just tore them all up, uh, which was really, you know, there was, there, yeah, you know, it was re I'm really, I re really wish I hadn't. Uh, but it is now, um, the, 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 it's now absolutely normal. And if we look at recent ops in Iraq, Afghanistan, from some of our current generation of service men and service women, many, many, many of them wrote last letters. And I think a book came out not so long ago, where the, the, you know, the tragedy of some of the men and women killed in Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, some of their last letters, their relatives gave permission for them to be published. So it's yeah. kind of a quite an important, um, it's an important part of being in the military. You know, I, 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 the, one of the stories in the book uh, is about a lady called uh, Elaine, Elaine Shaw at the time. Her dad was killed 
uh, on the Pinamunda, an op that you know a lot about, obviously. Uh, and she basically, she remembers waving him off when he got on the, whatever it was, the number 39 bus to head off back to base for that operation. Uh, and saying that one of his last words were, look after your mum and your little baby sister. Elaine was what, 10 I think at the time, and I'll be back to see you soon. And he never came home. And the, uh, what, the, the only thing that he had was the, the telegram that said he's missing on operations and then a lot of toing and froing uh, until six or seven months later, he was finally declared uh, he's dead. But she said that he'd simply disappeared. He'd gone. There was no, nobody really knew what happened. There was some supposition, but nobody really knew. There was nothing left. They got a, um, they got a little, they got his last, his effects, uh, his personal possessions in a little kind of brown parcel because they didn't have much. And it, it's detailed in poignant, really moving detail. A pair of braces slightly damaged, one Parker pen not functioning, yeah. uh, one t shirt. Um, a pair of shorts, some underpants, and that was it. That was his life. Yeah. And he'd gone. And she said, he'd gone. And there was nothing. He was rarely spoken about in the house. They simply had to move on. And one can, there was no funeral. There was no memorial service. There was mm. nothing. Mm. He'd just not come home from war one night. Yes. And if you think about it like that, it's horrifying. But then as she said, he was just one of 55,000 men of Bomber Command. Mm. You couldn't, you know, you, you would be having church services and memorial services and flowers and, you know, Twitter campaigns, whatever the, whatever the, the equivalent would be then. You'd be having them five and six times a day. Yeah. So you just didn't do it. Yeah. He was dead, gone. He wasn't coming home. Move on with your life. Yeah. That's quite sad and really affected Elaine for her whole life. And she still remembers that day. Yes, and um, I, I remember interviewing a family about an article about an um, a, a air gunner who, who was lost. And uh, the brother said to me, he said he remembers VE Day and everybody celebrating VE Day. And he couldn't work out yeah. why they were celebrating because yeah. his brother wasn't coming back. And every anniversary, he, he actually still, um, still struggles with. Uh, in and, 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 that. That is, you know, and many, many people are like Elaine in the book says they're exactly the same thing. See, she said, VE Day. She was at the bottom of her path watching the street parties. And we've seen recently in the last couple of weeks all those wonderful kind mm. of old footage of the street parties. She said she was watching that. Her, man, her mother called her and said, Elaine, come on in. There's nothing for us to celebrate. And they went in and kind of shut the door and shut themselves away. That is so sad. Yeah. But just one of 55 and a half, 55,000 plus from Bomber Command. But all of the other people, never mind all the bomber command, all of the rest of the, the British military, and then think of the, what the worldwide cost in the millions. Russia, of course. Yes. You know, just think of all of those people whose fathers, brothers, uncles, granddads went off to war, simply never came home. Nothing else. That's really sad. And I think it still ripples acro across families now. But I think what, this is what I like about the book is you, it's Lancaster. But the Lancaster is the canvas for all of these stories to be told against, to be, and, and, and again, poignancy come, comes through again and again. Um, I'm gonna ask you one last question, put you on the spot here. And uh, uh, someone, I remember someone was asked, what's the best aircraft in the Second World War? And uh, the way they got out of it, well, that's very difficult to say, but if they had to pick a man of the match, they'd choose the Spitfire. So now you've written Spitfire, <laughs> and now you've written Lancaster. <laughs> I've got, I've got a copy of Spitfire here, actually. Oh, well, you, you hold I've, up Spitfire, and I'll, I'll there we do go. that. <laughs> there you go. So, but um, I, I, you know. <laughs> so um, man of the match, Lancaster or Spitfire? I, I, you know, I'm not ducking the question, Steve, but you can't answer that question. It is like people saying, you know, was there a, an operation uh, wet on the ground or in the air or at sea that was a war winning operation? So you can't, I can't do that. You know, I, the Spitfire is an iconic, wonderful, fantastic aircraft. The Lancaster took the war to the heart of Nazi Germany when nobody else was doing it. You know, there's a lot of controversy about the bomber war. Some of it right, some of it wrong, some of it exaggerated, some of it simply falsified. But the Lancaster took yes. the bomber command, sorry, took the war to the heart of Germany from the first day of the war to the last day when nobody else could. Yes. And so 
It was a major part of the conflict, as was the Spitfire, as were the D-Day landings, as were the Atlantic convoys, as were, you know, the, 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 uh, the drops at Arnhem. All of them had a massive effect. The Dambusters raid to focus, obviously, on a more famous raid. So I would not say one aircraft is a better aircraft or, a, or had more of a, a war-winning effort. What I would say is that they all, without every single individual item, we wouldn't be where we are today. And yeah. for me, that's the most important thing. Though, you know, we're in the midst of, a, a, of the COVID crisis and we see people stepping up day after day after day, whether it's, the, whether it's the NHS, whether it's the police, whether it's the army of volunteers. We see people answering the call and that's what they did in the 1940s. They answered the call in a different way but they answered the call. And so I wouldn't pick a man or an aeroplane of the match. <laughs> I would say every single young person who put their hand up and said, I'll come, I'll volunteer, I'll do it, count me in. They were the, the, the men and the women of the match. Yeah, I, I, I like that answer and I will steal that answer. Um, <laughs> when I get, uh, get asked the question, I mean, I... I my grandfather's a Lancaster pilot, so I do uh, I do uh, that yeah. way so, that way somewhat in respect to Lancaster. John, that, that that's fantastic. Uh, thanks very much for that. We've Thank got um, John's book Lancaster comes out on the twenty eighth of May. Uh, we have signed copies available through the FightingHigh.com website. They're already uh, being bought now, um, and we've also got copies of, of John's excellent um, Spitfire. Uh, signed copies of, of the paperback of John Spitfire as well. So thank you very much, John, for, for that. Okay. Uh, I'm all for spreading the story of what this, this extraordinary generation of people did who yeah. were associated with Bomber Crown and Lancaster. And there is no question that this book uh, will, will spread the word. So um, thanks, mate. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Look after yourself.